No, they're not exactly synonyms. We can try to articulate tacit knowledge, but it's a trickier task. It takes a lot more effort. Many subtle facets are lost. So it's like saying, write me a manual on the secrets of making your wife happy. Well, each of us knows from practical experience what makes his wife happy and what doesn't, what bothers her. And we might be able to draw up a list of things, but I'm sure we'd overlook 90% of the subtle details that make the difference between success and failure in marital relationships. Well, the same is true in the world of business. It is subtle details that make the difference between the success and failure of a company. And it is subtle details that make the difference between the success and failure of a movie. We have great difficulty expressing this in words. But even though the explicit or implicit nature of something and the ability to articulate that thing are not exactly the same, a very close relationship exists between them. Mathematical language is the most formalized and articulate language of all. There are premises and they are deduced with absolute precision. What moves to the right when we add, moves to the left when we subtract. Everything is clearly set out. In contrast, verbal language is full of subtleties. Though we articulate it, it involves a much larger quantity of practical knowledge. A subjunctive, a conditional, or a subtle question carries much more meaning than the words themselves. As a result, verbal language is richer and more flexible than mathematical language, which is very rigid. Yes, well, since I am presenting a view of praxeology that is a bit more modern and generalized than Mises' view, I prefer to speak of human beings who are creative actors. Of course, if we were in the United States or England, we would all have to use he or she, he or she. It's really tedious to read books in which, to avoid being branded sexist, authors write or woman every time they write man, and they use he or she. When I talk about man, I mean man in the traditional sense, in both Spanish and English, namely human beings, and therefore the term includes both men and women. When I talk about human beings, I wish to convey the idea of people who possess the enormous wealth the human person possesses. This wealth manifests itself in the actions the person carries out. I avoided using the term individual because, although it is correct and Mises uses it, it sounds too ideological and reductionist, so to speak. You refer to the individual. Zapatero would say ciudadanos y ciudadanas, to include both male and female citizens. The term individual almost carries with it the idea of 19th century liberalism, of extreme individualism. We don't need those words when we have human beings. I'm referring to real, flesh and blood human beings like us. That's why I talk about man, who acts. In any case, the clarification is helpful. Freedom. Value freedom. He means that economics is a science free from value judgments. Do you remember when we said that ends are subjective because it is the acting subject who chooses them? And the same is true of means. In the sense that, as economic scientists, we cannot judge. We cannot condemn or applaud the ends or the means the actor chooses, discovers or creates. If you recall, I offered the example of the chief of a tribe of cave dwellers in New Guinea. His son gets sick, and the chief is convinced that the best means of helping the boy is to call the witch doctor to perform some exorcisms and save him. The moment the chief subjectively decides that calling the witch doctor is a means, because it will permit him to drive away the demons that are afflicting the boy and keeping him sick, at that moment, regardless of the value judgments we could make, he's an idiot. What a backward guy. Why doesn't he give his son the antibiotic? At that moment, the chosen means has already become an economic good, and all the laws of economics, scarcity, etc., apply. If a young lady believes that applying a certain chemical substance to her face every night will make her more attractive, even if it's not true, her belief is enough to immediately transform the substance into an economic good, and all the economics laws we are studying would apply. 
So as scientists, we cannot, from the outside, judge to be good or bad the ends actors creatively discover. As doctors, we can judge the ends. As a doctor, I could say, this guy's an idiot. Why doesn't he give the child an antibiotic? I can judge from the perspective of a 21st century human being who knows the most appropriate and technological means to achieve a certain end. But as far as economics is concerned, my judgment is irrelevant. Imagine, for instance, that people want water from the Jordan River for christening children. I remember that example because in Spain, Jordan water was marketed for many years. It was sold in little bottles. It became fashionable in parish churches for christenings. For some reason, people thought a christening with water from the Jordan River had more value added from the Holy Spirit than a christening with tap water. How silly. If you asked any theologian, he would say, that's poppycock. Well, we condemn it, but that is irrelevant to us, because the moment people subjectively decide a resource will help them achieve an end, that resource has already become scarce, and therefore all the laws of economics apply to it. So, economics is a positive science free from value judgments. The idea I want to astound us, for when you really think about it, it is worthy of amazement, is that in the social process, whenever there is a maladjustment or discoordination, that is, whenever someone acts without an awareness of or against the needs of another in any sphere, this maladjustment emerges as a latent profit opportunity to be discovered by any entrepreneur. Thus, the enormous power of the profit motive of each and every one of us, the 7 billion people in the world, all in search of profit, springs into action to detect, without our knowledge, those situations of maladjustment or discoordination and overcome them. In other words, people act to take advantage of profit opportunities, and whenever they discover, detect and seize them, and pocket the corresponding profit, they create information, they transmit information, and what is more, they coordinate previously maladjusted behavior. This is precisely what makes life in society possible. Do you know what a challenge it is, or would be, to organize from above, through a government agency, the coordination of those seven billion human beings, each endowed with a creative capacity, with all of his or her own peculiarities, and with variable ends, etc.? It is a theoretically impossible task. And yet, through the spontaneous market order fueled by entrepreneurship, this process of creativity and coordination takes place every day. Furthermore, creativity and coordination occur simultaneously. Expansive creativity, because we are able to discover from nothing new things that change the universe around us, and thus that disrupt everything and generate continual maladjustments. And also coordination, because those maladjustments take the form of profit opportunities, which entrepreneurs tend to discover and coordinate. I call this expansion a Big Bang. The Big Bang is a metaphorical expression taken from the world of the natural sciences. It refers to the first instant of the universe, when an explosion occurred. Bang! We don't know what caused it. There was nothing. And suddenly an explosion took place, and the universe began. Astrophysics specialists refer to this phenomenon as the Big Bang. I use the expression metaphorically, and say that the social process is the most complex order in the universe, much more complex than that of astrophysics, because the social process is driven by creative human beings like us, and it is continually expanding, a continuous Big Bang. In this expansion, creativity in the minds of all those who make up humanity causes knowledge to constantly expand, and numerous instances of discoordination result. But the entrepreneurial process itself tends to determine detect, discover, and coordinate them. The entrepreneurs who fuel the creative explosion, which Schumpeter called the process of creative destruction, also make this limitless expansion, this Big Bang, as coordinated as humanly possible in each set of historical circumstances. Note that this Big Bang is constant, unlike the initial explosion that gave rise to the universe and the world of physics. In the life of society, the Big Bang is continuous. The expansion is as coordinated as humanly possible, for, I repeat, every maladjustment takes the shape of a profit opportunity, which entrepreneurs tend to discover. And when they act and take advantage of that opportunity, they coordinate the behavior of the economic agents involved.
I'd like to briefly touch on two concepts, arbitrage and speculation. I bring them up because they have gained acceptance in economic science. However, from a theoretical standpoint, there is no difference between them. Arbitrage refers to entrepreneurship exercised all in the same moment in time, that is, in the present. I buy low today and sell high tomorrow. And speculation refers to entrepreneurship exercised at different moments in time. Nevertheless, I repeat, these concepts have become accepted, but practically speaking, from a theoretical standpoint, they are one and the same. To discover something today that was unknown before is equivalent to creating it. As we said the other day, when Columbus discovered America, though it was already there, he as good as created it. No entrepreneurial behavior is simultaneous, perfectly synchronous. In other words, ipso facto, I buy low and sell high. Instead, all human action is sequential and dynamic. Even when very little time appears to pass between the two actions, there is always a series of stages which makes up subjective time. And therefore, everything is speculation. The difference between the two concepts is simply practical in nature. It is not scientific or rigorous. Arbitrageurs are people who buy low and sell high in a close temporal setting. In other words, the present, in which no major changes occur in the context. In contrast, speculators are people who, for instance, buy a piece of land low today with the idea that it is going to become very valuable within five years because the needs of the city are going to move toward that neighborhood. The speculator is waiting for that to happen. And he or she fulfills a very important social function. For if it is true that in five years there is going to be a great demand for certain uses, and nobody anticipates that, and the land is assigned an erroneous use today, a satisfaction of future needs will be frustrated. Thus, speculators are the quintessence of entrepreneurship. Remember that the word speculator derives etymologically from specula, a watchtower from which to observe whatever is approaching. Speculation is a typical expression of well-exercised entrepreneurship, and it fulfills a very significant social function. Thus, the difference between arbitrage and speculation is one of practical importance, but not of rigorous theoretical content. Listen, the entire entrepreneurial process would be frustrated if, for example, the people involved failed to carry out certain pattern behaviors. Imagine I go to the person who has the misused resource. I offer to buy it. And when the moment of truth comes, I don't hand over the promised money. Or he or she doesn't give me the resource. Or the quantity and quality agreed upon. Or I, as the entrepreneur, commit a criminal act. And when I go to resell it to the person who needs it so urgently, I deliver a different good from the one that is needed. If entrepreneurship is to occur with the three effects we have studied, creation, transmission and coordination or adjustment, the parties involved must subject their behavior to a series of patent rules, and these constitute law. We use the term law to refer to the set of behavioral guidelines which govern relationships between human beings, especially in the area of exchanges, civil law, commercial law. These guidelines are formed in an evolutionary manner. They are institutions or customary behaviors that are gradually discovered throughout history. As a result of the behavior of generations upon generations of human beings. And those social groups which are quick to internalize these behaviors boost their entrepreneurship more and prevail over other social groups which fail to internalize them. So what I'm telling you is that law, as an institution, emerges from the evolutionary market process itself and at the same time makes it possible. A feedback process emerges from the market process, and as the former is refined, it drives or perfects the latter. A feedback process. Every year I give an example. How, in abstract terms, does a basic legal institution emerge as an essential institution? 
Property law as an institution essential to the market process. Well, it evolves. Human beings did not discover the contract of sale in a clearly defined form. All anthropological studies show that there is a lengthy evolutionary process. I offer the example of the Mediterranean. I mention the Mediterranean because that is the region where civilization emerged, where trade emerged. Trade polishes and softens barbarous customs, according to Montesquieu, who spoke of sweet commerce. Where trade is absent, there is violence. Certain civilizations sprang up to the east of the Mediterranean. For example, the Phoenicians established a series of trading posts or commercial cities along the Mediterranean Sea. Carthage was the most important, and Carthaginian colonies spread as far as Spain. The Greeks did the same, and later the Romans. Los fenicios en un primer momento, vamos a poner con sus naves, han oído hablar de que hay... So, let us imagine, let us visualize the initial arrival of the Phoenicians with their ships. They have heard that in the westernmost part of the Mediterranean, Finisterre, where the land ends, there lies a very rich and fertile region, where there is plenty of gold and natural resources and minerals, etc. They have also heard that the inhabitants are quite uncivilized, that they are warlike tribes that are nearly impossible to deal with. And sure enough, because the first trireme, or the first ship, arrived with excited Phoenicians eager to reach a trade agreement, and when they went ashore, they were met by some Celtiberians who were nasty brutes. Whose only thought was to do what they had done for thousands of years, attack the people, kill them all, and eat them. And that is probably what happened in the beginning, the first time, or the second, or the third. And some smouldering remains, some dead bodies were left on the beach. The ship was burnt, etc. I'm writing a novel here, but this historical account of what may have been is very close to what really happened. In the process of humanity, there is always a vanguard of actors endowed with greater alertness, relatively speaking. Maybe the son of one of the Celtiberian tribe members found a small looking glass among the smouldering remains and was surprised to see his reflection. Hey, I can see my face, but not very well because this is broken and also burnt. And maybe he kept it with care, and 20 or 30 years passed. The Phoenicians embarked on their trade adventure once again. This time, since they knew the others had never returned, they went more heavily armed, and again they disembarked on the Spanish shores. And the former child, who had been fascinated by the looking glass, still has it, and he wears it here with great pride. And when he sees the sailors coming ashore, maybe a light bulb goes on in his head, and he says, wait, a creative light bulb. Notice we are talking about anonymous historical figures, because we don't know their first and last names. Shh! Wait! The light bulb goes on. Wait! What can I do to get mirrors from these people? Because I'm sure they have some. What I feel like doing, and what we've done for thousands of years, is destroy the travelers, kill them, and eat them. But maybe... Ah! I have an idea! What do I do when I want to get on someone's good side? A gift? Well, let's see. Let's offer them a gift. I have more than enough daughters. I'll give them my daughters! I offer the example of giving away the daughters because we've all seen westerns. We've all seen westerns in which a man in search of furs comes to town and wants to please the tribal chief, and the tribal chief says to him, in exchange for the Winchester rifle, I'll give you... I'd like some furs. Yes, yes, but I'm very pleased. I'll give you the furs and my daughter. Well, the daughter is fat, nasty, and smells like grease. And the poor hero of the movie says, no, no, I don't want this. And the other guy elbows him in the ribs and says, hey, they'll scalp us. You're taking her. You've got no choice. To refuse will be an insult. So they end up with the nasty, fat, greasy daughter and the furs, and the tribal chief is happy as can be with a drum of whiskey and a rifle, an exchange of gifts. I've jumped forward 2,000 years, but let's go back to the time of the Phoenicians. An exchange of gifts, and the Phoenicians come covered with beads, with fabrics dyed purple, thanks to some mollusks they discovered on the beach, and mirrors and glass, which the Celtiberians have never seen, and so they value them highly. 
Later, we will discuss the law of diminishing marginal utility. What can the brute offer? Well, he offers his somewhat fat and greasy daughters, but he also has pips of gold here, etc. So, there is an exchange of gifts. I'll give you my pips of gold and two girls if you give me... And there it is, an exchange of gifts. I give to you and you give to me. When this exchange of gifts is on a much larger scale and becomes abstract, it turns into the contract of sale. The evolutionary process is very lengthy. As a result of the spontaneous market process itself, we discover institutions or pattern behaviors in the sphere of law, as we are discussing now, or that of morality. Morality and law are very closely related. Law can be imposed by force, but morality cannot. Polite behaviors, personal morality, family principles, etc. We discover moral, linguistic, and, as we will see, economic institutions like money. All of these institutions emerge from the spontaneous market process, and at the same time, they make this process possible. Of these institutions, the most important are money and property rights. As we will see, these institutions permit what we will call market prices to take shape in exchanges. Market prices are historical ratios of exchange, and they make economic calculation possible. The term calculation derives from the Latin calx, calcis. Do you know what Roman abacuses were? The Romans had no calculators, but they, and the Chinese as well, added and subtracted very quickly using an abacus, which was a series of lines with perforated limestone pebbles in them. A person could perform fast calculations with them, ones, tens, hundreds, each of the pebbles was made of limestone, calx, and since the term calculi was used to refer to the pebbles, the abacus, which enabled people to calculate, led to the term economic calculation. We will see how economic calculation is made possible by the bridge that connects the internal subjective realm of valuations, I think I gave an example in class, with the external realm of computation. The bridge is the existence of a free market in which exchanges take place, thanks to property rights, and these exchanges are reflected in monetary prices, because there is a monetary unit. There is an ordinal realm of subjective valuations, and it permits only comparisons, greater than or less than. It is an internal realm, internal, ordinal. And there is a cardinal realm of numerical calculations, and it permits computation. What keeps the world in constant motion is the internal realm of our subjective valuations. Nevertheless, out in the market we see quotes, stock exchanges, prices, numbers, balance sheets. How do we pass from the internal ordinal realm to the external cardinal realm? What bridge connects them? We will see that this bridge comprises two institutions, free exchanges and money, which is an institution. Where these two are present, a market price is set in each exchange, and the market price reflects a quantitative historical reality, which permits numerical computation. If, on the contrary, as occurs in socialist regimes, the free exchange of capital goods is prevented by force, then market prices cannot be set for these goods, and economic calculation is blocked. So we see how institutions emerge from the market process, while at the same time they make it and economic calculation possible. We will define economic calculation as the entrepreneurial estimate, in terms of monetary units, of the value to acting human beings of the different alternatives or courses of action they imagine. People need to make that calculation to know which alternative is most important or valuable to them and direct their action towards achieving it, while rejecting those they value less. As you know, the cost is the subjective value attached to what is given up when a person acts. Well, in the process of human action, Economic calculation directs us towards those ends we value most, and it reduces the costs or helps us avoid incurring costs that exceed the value of our ends. That is, it helps us avoid losses. Economic calculation is possible due to the information entrepreneurship generates when people buy and sell in the market, 
and to the institutions which emerge from the entrepreneurial process and at the same time make this process possible. Language is another essential institution, the language we speak. It also emerges in an evolutionary manner. No one discovered Spanish. It emerged as the result of an evolutionary process. So did double-entry accounting. It is also a curious language. It arose over many generations of merchants who needed to be able to determine whether they had made a gain or sustained a loss and set budgets for the future. Economic science is full of wonders, isn't it? There is a peculiar apparent paradox in the fact that the institutions most vital to human beings, to our lives, to our achieving success in our chosen projects, morality, law, language, money, the institutions which are most important to human civilization have not been deliberately created by anybody. Instead, they have arisen owing to custom throughout a spontaneous process involving millions of human beings from many generations. However, if you think about it, this should not surprise us, since those institutions are so vital to our lives precisely because they incorporate a huge volume of experience, of knowledge or information, which happens to come from the millions of human beings who have participated, each with his or her own small contribution of experience throughout history. This vast volume of information far exceeds any human being's capacity to analyze or comprehend it, no matter how wise or good the person is. Only a posteriori, in view of the institutions which have taken shape, can economic science account for even the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. A fraction of the role played by these institutions, these pattern behaviors, which, as we recall, enable human beings to face, with greater chances of success, the ineradicable uncertainty that pervades our lives. We don't know what the future will be like because it will depend on entrepreneurial knowledge which is constantly, at all times, being created ex novo. I could mention another institution, the company, understood as an economic organization which is an integral part of the entrepreneurial process. The next section is titled The Ubiquity of Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship as an unalloyed component, so to speak, is dispersed to a greater or lesser extent among all human beings. Therefore, every person is an entrepreneur by virtue of being human. So, it is not only entrepreneurs stricto sensu, in the specific historical sense, or the ideal type, that is, people who have started companies who are entrepreneurs. Consumers are entrepreneurs as well. When I go shopping or to a superstore, I am exercising my creativity. Why do I decide to buy one product instead of another? Maybe I've seen the advertising, or maybe a neighbor has suggested the product to me. Suddenly, it seems more attractive, and in an environment of uncertainty, I either buy it or I don't. If I do, I then try it, and it may turn out I have made a mistake, because the product is not as good as was thought. I remember a famous commercial. Hello, mom. Here I have some aerial laundry detergent, and here you have another leading brand. Now, let's see. We're going to put a shirt into the washing machine with some detergent. We'll use the other leading brand. The shirt comes out gray. Okay. Now we're going to do the same with some aerial detergent. Ta-da! The shirt comes out gleaming white. Which do you prefer, mom? The woman responds, Ariel, of course. And the interviewer says, Listen, I'll trade you five boxes of this other leading brand for that box of Ariel. And she responds, No, thank you. I want my Ariel. Yes, no. Yes, no, etc. When we see this commercial, we all end up convinced that we need to buy Ariel laundry detergent. And off we go to buy some Ariel. But maybe later, when we put it into the washing machine, the machine explodes. Everything gets covered in soap suds. Water leaks into the apartment of the guy downstairs. And the whole thing is a disaster. So I have committed an entrepreneurial error. Or maybe not. As consumers, we constantly exercise entrepreneurship, as capitalists do. We will see that a capitalist is someone who does not consume everything he or she earns, but instead saves part of it. As capitalists, we are also entrepreneurs, for where do we invest what we save? We invest it in our own enterprises, or in those of our friends, or we lend it to a financial institution, or we buy bonds. We are in an environment of uncertainty between different alternatives, and we choose between them. We are entrepreneurs. Artists are entrepreneurs as well. A screenwriter, a film director, how will I approach this film? The difference is that these people are entrepreneurs of the creative arts. There are also entrepreneurs in the sphere of philanthropy, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, for instance, and in the academic sphere. 
Entrepreneurship is dispersed among all human beings, to a greater or lesser extent. Regardless of the sphere in which human action is carried out, our entrepreneurship is present. That is why I talk about the ubiquity of entrepreneurship. Do you know what it means to have the gift of ubiquity? What does it mean to have the gift of ubiquity? It means to be in different places at the same time. That's what happens with entrepreneurship. It is spread out, and therefore, you have entrepreneurial capacity, and you have entrepreneurial capacity. We all have entrepreneurship. What is the essential principle of entrepreneurship? Well, the essential principle of entrepreneurship is that when a human being acts entrepreneurially, he or she discovers or creates an end. As I have said, in terms of economics, to discover is synonymous with to create. The actor values the end, and that is why he or she creates it, mobilizes the means, and undertakes an action comprised of stages to achieve that end. Though there is no guarantee, people have a tendency to achieve their ends. The reason we tend to accomplish what we set our minds to is obvious. Imagine I am lost in a storm at night, which is one of the most horrible situations to be in, and I can't see anything, and I have no compass. That is horrible. But if I suddenly stumble upon a compass that shows me the north, or between the crests of the waves, I see the light of a distant lighthouse, then I leap into action. I focus all of my being on reaching the harbor. I tend to move in that direction. It's as if we had directional satellite dishes. If I suddenly detect an end worthwhile to me, for example, getting my degree in audiovisual sciences and becoming a successful screenwriter or film editor, etc., and I devote myself entirely to this end, then the information I gradually distill and create will be oriented toward this end, and I will find myself approaching it. Certainly, if I am lost and I have 360 degrees of possibilities for directing my actions, and I focus myself entirely on one point, I will tend to approach it. If I say to myself, what I want is to find the woman of my life and get married, and I'm going to devote all of my creative energy to this goal, then I will most likely find the woman of my life and get married. But if I say, ah, what do I want with women, then it's a lost cause. Do you see what I mean? Let's say I have a vision. I am Bill Gates. What I want is to find a product that will satisfy the needs of millions of human beings in the field of computers, and I end up developing an operating system. There is a tendency, but not a guarantee. There is no guarantee. We live in an environment of uncertainty. We might commit entrepreneurial errors, etc. But we move forward by trial and error. We may fail many times, but if we head straight for the harbor, the essential principle is that we will tend to reach the goal we set our minds to. Nevertheless, this principle has a peculiarity, and I explain it on pages 30 and 31. If, due to institutional factors, for example, the government or the caste system in India, etc., access to entrepreneurship is blocked in any area of society, then this law of tendency will be blocked. Entrepreneurs' creativity, their transmission of information, and the coordination that results will all be prevented in that area. And we will see that precisely to the extent that the state intervenes in the economy, in the areas in which it intervenes, and to the extent that this intervention is effective, the process of coordination is blocked, and continuous maladjustments and conflicts arise. In fact, all of the social conflicts you can name today are rooted in state intervention. Though it seems counterintuitive, when the state does not intervene, the spontaneous order in any area tends to systematically discover and coordinate maladjustments. So it is only institutional restrictions which block the law of tendency, the essential principle, according to which we tend to achieve what we set our minds to. If the postal service has a monopoly on delivering letters, and private companies are not allowed to participate, then an enormous amount of entrepreneurial creativity which could be put into action in that area is blocked. At any rate, despite all of the legislation, entrepreneurial creativity emerges in a thousand forms, and messengers appear, fax machines appear, and the internet appears, etc., and so on. Still, a curious thing happens, and it illustrates the wisdom of the old Spanish maxim, hoyos que no ven, corazón que no siente, or out of sight, out of mind. 
Indeed, in those areas where the state applies its prohibitions, divisions, interventions and obstacles, to the extent that these measures are successful, and because they remove entrepreneurship from those areas, we will not even be aware of all that this entrepreneurial prevention of human action keeps us from creating. How much entrepreneurial creativity is lost because the state prohibits private ownership of the streets? A vast world. Or because it prevents drugs from being freely produced and distributed, etc. An enormous entrepreneurial effort would be made to find less and less harmful drugs. Ones that would be attractive to consumers but would have fewer harmful effects. All of that effort is blocked. Either it is blocked and all entrepreneurial spirit disappears, or an effort is made in a concealed way through the underground economy or the black market, etc. For a great many years, in the Soviet Union and the surrounding region, photocopiers were banned. Why? Because the authorities were afraid books would be written against the political regime and photocopied on a massive scale, subversive books from the authorities' point of view. So the students all had to take notes by hand and they spent countless hours copying down their notes by hand in the Soviet Union, when in Europe one person would take notes and these would be quickly photocopied and distributed. Students in the Soviet Union were not aware of all that the environment they lived in kept them from creating. When people started smuggling in CDs, DVDs, etc. of movies and shows, I remember the most popular being the TV series Dallas. You were very small, but there was a character named JR who wore a huge cowboy hat. Anyway, when the Soviets began to watch smuggled movies, they came into contact for the first time with many details of the Western world. And from that point on, the regime's days were numbered, because until then, what was out of sight was out of mind. But once a person has seen something, he thinks about it. Hey, look what they have in the West. From then on, the end was in sight, and the regime collapsed because the Soviets had seen many things they were missing. That is why free trade is such a good policy for what we might call a closed country. Cuba, for instance, because where there is trade, people come into contact with and see the creative wealth of others. And they ask themselves, why shouldn't I have access to this and, like others, be able to grow as a human being? People realize what they suffer when the dictatorial environment they live in blocks their very nature, their creativity. And that realization unleashes an extremely powerful, unstoppable force for freedom. I then close this section with a tribute to individuality. As we have seen, entrepreneurial knowledge is exclusive in the sense that each one of us possesses knowledge that is unique in the world. And our unique knowledge, with its particular variety of rich details and subtleties, has never existed before. Nor does it exist anywhere else now nor will it ever exist again in the future. You might be saying to yourself, well, what do you know? Here I thought I was a dimwit, a nobody, a dull person. That's how I see myself. But Professor Huerta de Soto says I am unique in the universe. Well, you are. Each of us is unique, no matter how awkward, dull, uneducated or thick-headed we may think we are. Even the most limited people, those who possess the least articulate knowledge, can contribute to the entrepreneurial process in a way that is decisive of the historical development of humanity. I remember there used to be a TV show called L.A. Law. Have any of you ever watched it? I will never forget that an intellectually disabled person worked in the office. Perhaps he had Down syndrome. He was very large and rather awkward, and he worked there in the office. As you know, political correctness and quotas, etc., are very important to Americans. That's all fine. I have no problem with it. So this man worked at the law firm. But what could he do if he had a mental age of only six, even though he may have been 50? Well, you can see him working on the show. He passes out the coffee. He doesn't do a very good job of it, though, because it takes him all morning to pass it out, and he often spills it on the documents. He also delivers the mail with great effort. Well, even he could have a flash of entrepreneurial creativity that would change the history of the world. And his delivering a letter on time or not, or his spilling coffee at a certain moment, could change the world. Think about it. This should be a source of joy and optimism, because even the people society tends to value least, or indeed to overlook, have their capacity to contribute entrepreneurial creativity to the process of the social universe. 
A poem Leon Felipe wrote in one of his moments of greatest inspiration reflects this truth very well. He writes, No one traveled yesterday, nor travels today, nor will travel tomorrow toward God by this same path I'm traveling. For each man, the sun saves a new ray of light and God a virgin path. In other words, each of us has a unique and historically unrepeatable path from the viewpoint of entrepreneurial creativity. No matter how small we really are or think we are, and we are all small and insignificant in reality, and no matter how downcast we may at times feel, we should be very proud of our uniqueness. Life is a challenge. Life is an opportunity. It's true that life has its share of problems and uncertainty, but at at the same time, the fact that we can take part as entrepreneurial actors, especially young people like you, gives life its spice. This should encourage and challenge us. It should fill us with enthusiasm. I say young people like you, but I'm referring to myself as well. I'm 52. Youth is really an attitude, a creative, entrepreneurial, enthusiastic, optimistic attitude. To be young is to say to ourselves, what a privilege it is to be able to act entrepreneurially in the context of our lives. It's a privilege to be acting now. It's a privilege to be here in class, isn't it? Am I right? Today, Tuesday, October the 27th, 2009, there's nothing better than to be here philosophizing about the privilege it is, about how simply awesome it is to be a man or a woman and to act. We should all be delighted. We're all raring to go, right? We're all going to leave class today full of energy and enthusiasm, are we not? Yes or no? In his work El Greco y Toledo, Gregorio Maranon writes, each living person, even the most humble, creates merely by being alive. Even the most humble, even a person who lives by blind faith alone, creates merely by being alive. Now, let's move on to the next section, which is devoted to competition and entrepreneurship. By its very nature, the entrepreneurial process is always competitive. We have talked about ends, values, means, costs, plans, information, creativity, coordination, the transmission of information, and now we'll take another step and talk about competition. Another essential concept around which economic science revolves, competition. By its very nature, this entrepreneurial process we are describing, this spontaneous social process entrepreneurs drive, is always competitive. The word competition derives from the Latin competito, which means concurrence. In fact, the Latin word was concurrentium the concurrence of multiple requests for the same thing, which must be assigned an owner. This is the meaning of competition. In other words, more than one person says, I want that, and there is only one item, and it must be decided who gets it. The entrepreneurial process is always competitive. In what sense? Well, in the sense that the entrepreneurial process is a process of rivalry, in which entrepreneurs contend with each other, to discover and seize the profit opportunities that emerge around them before others discover and seize these opportunities. We could put it another way. Once I, the entrepreneur, create or discover a profit opportunity and I grasp it and take the profit, no other entrepreneur can discover and grasp that same profit opportunity. That opportunity, with its specific circumstances of time and place, has been eliminated because I have already taken advantage of it. Therefore, entrepreneurs vie to be the first to discover and seize each opportunity because the first to do so eliminates the specific opportunity in question, which is no longer available to other people. That is the heart of the market process entrepreneurship fuels. You're going to understand it right away. Nayara is the most attractive girl the loveliest girl in the class. Let's just say we're all crazy for her. We all want to win Nayara's affections, and so we each begin to act. The first guy who successfully wins her over and marries her makes Nayara unavailable to anybody else. So there is a process of competition or rivalry here, and Nayara couldn't be happier. She feels like a queen, and all of her suitors approach her. I can offer you this. Well, I can offer you that. And she listens off-handedly, if she feels like it. Once someone has discovered and seized a profit opportunity, it no longer exists for anybody else. Thus, the process is competitive. It is a process of rivalry. I have given you this example because you are contending with each other in the market for relationships between young people. The process, in the sphere of business, in the sphere of human relationships, in the sphere of academics, is always competitive. It is always a process of rivalry. For once an entrepreneur has detected and grasped a profit opportunity, 
he or she has eliminated it for all other entrepreneurs at any level. This is a process of rivalry. Now, I'd like to pose a question to you. Would it be conceivable, of course, when a profit opportunity is seized, it is eliminated, would it be conceivable for a point to arrive when entrepreneurs, that is, all of us, had detected and seized all profit opportunities and the social process came to a halt? because all maladjustments have been discovered and coordinated. Is such a situation conceivable? Yes or no? No. The correct answer is no. But why not? This is important because my colleagues, mathematical economists, center their study of the economy on a hypothetical final state of rest that will be reached once all profit opportunities or maladjustments have been discovered and coordinated. At that point, the social process would stop. It's a frozen world a monotonous state of nirvana in equilibrium, in which there are no longer any entrepreneurs, because they are unnecessary, since all maladjustments have already been discovered and coordinated. Well, my colleagues use that model as an object of research in economics, because it is the only model that permits a mathematical approach. It is the model of equilibrium. In contrast, we reject this model and focus on the spontaneous market process driven by real flesh and blood entrepreneurs, a process which is never exhausted and never stops. Why? Well, we know that once I discover a profit opportunity and take advantage of it, I block it and eliminate it for other people. That is why there is competition to see who will discover it first. But remember, what are the effects of the entrepreneurial act? coordination and adjustment, the transmission of information, but also creativity. When I act entrepreneurially, I create and transmit in the market new information, which in turn causes subsequent maladjustments that remain latent to be discovered by entrepreneurs tomorrow, who will tend to discover and eliminate them through a process of rivalry, but who in turn will generate new information tomorrow that will cause more maladjustments the day after tomorrow, and so on, in the social Big Bang, the limitless and endless expansion of knowledge in the market process. Okay, so let's say I marry Nayara, and I block her for others. I make her unavailable to everybody else. Does this mean everybody else goes out and shoots himself? Well, maybe. Maybe one guy will come close to doing himself in, and another will be down in the dumps for two months. But what do people say to a guy who's been disappointed in love and is feeling depressed? Hey, listen, there are plenty of fish in the sea. In fact, there are 3 billion, 500 million women in the world, and lots of them are very lovely and attractive. Come on, you need to get away for a while. Take a trip. You're sure to find a cross-eyed beauty up in Galathea or somewhere. Anyway, even if that doesn't work, there's nothing to worry about because new girls are being born all the time. You may have to wait till you're 35 for the woman of your life to be 17, because she's being born now. The process never comes to a halt. New opportunities are arising constantly, so it's not the end of the world. My dear fellow men, when a lady jilts us and we feel depressed, let us remember there are still many latent opportunities. It's true that in the process of rivalry, for the affections of that specific girl, we have failed. But there are many more girls out there. And besides, every cloud has a silver lining. And now, without further ado, we are ready to examine the marvelous process of the division of knowledge. Economists express this idea with the traditional term, the division of labor. We can trace this term back to Adam Smith. But the division of labor is not a suitable term. It is more appropriate to talk about the division of knowledge. To begin with, the capacity of the human mind to assimilate information is limited. There can be no doubt that our mental capacity is limited. Does anyone here doubt it? To put it another way, we are not omniscient. In fact, anthropological studies show the capacity of the modern human mind to be the same as that of the human mind 50,000, 100,000 or 150,000 years ago. Our mental capacity has not increased at all. So, if our capacity for assimilation is limited, how is it possible that we are able to take advantage of an ever-increasing and constantly expanding volume of knowledge? How is it possible that I can take advantage of all the knowledge involved in the making of this watch, the tailoring of this suit, 
the production of the contact lenses I'm wearing, the technological transmission devices I have on me, microphones, etc. These shoes, pens to write with. We don't know them, but thousands and thousands of people have contributed their entrepreneurial creativity. They have placed it at our service, and at this moment we are benefiting from all that experience and all that knowledge that we don't have. Furthermore, as civilization advances, we take advantage of a greater and greater volume of knowledge. The knowledge connected with the rudimentary goods I am wearing today far surpasses that connected with the goods of, say, a Roman centurion with his sword and sandals. It's quite simple. If the mental capacity of human beings is the same, how is it possible that we sustain an ever-increasing volume of entrepreneurial knowledge? The only thing that can make this possible is a constant increase in the number of minds, in the number of human beings. That is, the necessary condition for economic development is ever-increasing growth in the population. Continuado, creciente, si quieren ustedes, más que cre proporcionalmente creciente, exponencialmente creciente de la población. Esto por otro lado es obvio. Porque los At the same time, this is obvious because human beings are not ants. We are not bacteria. We are not a homogeneous resource. Instead, since each human being is endowed with an innate creative capacity, the more people there are, the better. Fíjense. Note that the creative conception of entrepreneurship is leading us to conclusions radically opposite to those we hear about, conclusions which people commonly draw and which originated with Malthus. Malthus was a genius, and he discovered a perfectly valid law, but it cannot be applied to human beings. It is applicable to bacteria and rats, that is, to animals or homogeneous resources. Though some people may disagree, bacteria and rats are not human beings. No disponen de una innata capacidad creativa. They lack an innate creative capacity. It turns out that rats reproduce until they reach the limit of their food supply. And when they come to the end of their food, the population limits itself. The rats begin to die. If we were rats or penguins, our given resources would determine the volume of our population. We would have resources divided by population. The smaller the population, the more resources for each member. Each rat would get more cheese. The larger the number of rats, the less cheese for each. Well, it is tragic to think that generations and generations of economists have seen human beings like rats, like bacteria and like penguins. And these economists go on teaching classes and even receive Nobel Prizes sometimes. However, unfortunately for their models, human beings are not bacteria. They are not rats, but instead are endowed with an innate capacity for entrepreneurial creativity. Therefore, the conclusion to be drawn is exactly the opposite. The law of Malthus that is applied in the world of biology and the natural sciences is not applicable in the world of human action. Human beings are endowed with an innate capacity to create information. And the process of civilization's limitless expansion requires constant growth in the population. This constant growth in the population rests on a continual horizontal and vertical division of knowledge. What does this mean? It means that for expansion to occur, each human being must specialize in an increasingly restricted sphere of knowledge, and his or her knowledge must be of ever greater volume and depth. Then each person exchanges the results of his or her entrepreneurial creativity and production in that sphere for the results of other people's creativity and production. The process of the limitless expansion of knowledge is a process in which people constantly specialize in narrower spheres of knowledge, where they acquire an ever deeper knowledge. I refer to this as horizontal specialization, with respect to the number of spheres, and vertical specialization with respect to the depth of knowledge. In fact, if anything characterizes the advancement of civilization, it is that each human being knows less and less, in relative terms, not more. How odd! So we know less and less? Yes, each of these little ants knows less, in relative terms, compared to the whole. Has anyone seen a movie called Jeremiah Johnson? The main character, played by Robert Redford, is disgusted with the Mexican War of the 1840s. 
Well, he abandons the front, I think he practically deserts, and he escapes to the unexplored western plains, where only the Native American Indians live, and he goes up into the mountains to hunt. The movie shows the beginning of his new life, which is full of hardships. He takes his rifle, he has to hunt a bison, he has to remove the meat, he has to salt it, he has to skin the animal, he has to tan the skins and sew them. He makes himself some very simple coats. Using some branches, he fashions some crude snowshoes so he can walk in the snow. Everything about his life is hard. He has to run from the Indians. Bear in mind, he knows a lot because his mind compels him to survive and he has to know how to hunt, tan skins, cook, make clothes, build himself a crude shelter. A large quantity of knowledge in the horizontal sense. One day he is hunting and while he is aiming at a bison, right before he pulls the trigger, he hears a shot. Bang! And that shot from who knows who kills that very bison. Well, it turns out that in those hundreds of square kilometers, there was another hunter like him. The two hunters approach each other. Both are taken aback. They are both disheveled and have long beards. They're a terrible sight. Well, the entrepreneurial light bulb goes on for them, and they become friends. Hey, when did you get here? Me too. We're both from the east, and we've both been running from the war, etc. Well, the other hunter notices that his new friend has a remarkable ability and that in a flash he guts the bison and skins it. The light bulb goes on for the hunter and he says, hey, I'm a good shot. How about I do the hunting and you take care of the bison afterward, cutting it up, etc. What do you say? Take note, here we see what is known as the division of knowledge. One person has a comparative advantage in one task and he restricts his sphere of action to shooting, while the other restricts his sphere of action to tanning the skins, etc and they exchange the results of their efforts. The one who hunts says, hey, this is an exchange for some of the skins. And the one in charge of the skins says, but when you hunt a bison, hunt for me as well. And then they exchange the products of their creativity. There has been a division of knowledge. Each person specializes in the task in which he has a comparative advantage with respect to the other person. They then exchange the products of their creativity and they both come out ahead. Humanity emerged in this way too. Men went out to hunt, and women stayed, took care of the offspring, and prepared the game. Also, later, since they were settled, while others were nomadic and came only occasionally, they noticed that sometimes when a seed fell, wheat would grow, and they could eat it. How interesting! And the next year, the same thing. They wondered why that happened, and then it occurred to them. Why don't we plant the seeds? And sedentary farming began to emerge, the division of knowledge between people. I explain this process graphically as well. It is a process in which each of us increasingly specializes in the tasks in which we have a comparative advantage, and then we exchange with other people the results of our creativity. What if someone has a comparative advantage in all lines of production, in all areas with respect to another person? Would an exchange between the two be worthwhile or not? You say no. No. I'm better than you at hunting, at tanning skins, at everything. What now? Well, so long. You go your way, and since I'm better than you at everything, I'll go mine. Are we doing the right thing by going our separate ways? Or would it still be in our best interest to make an exchange? It would still be in our best interest to make an exchange. This is known as Ricardo's Law of Association. Ricardo was an economist and he stumbled upon this law while developing that of comparative advantage in international trade. We'll talk more about that in the future. Let me give you an example. Imagine a surgeon who is extremely skilled at performing operations, is also a very good anesthesiologist, and on top of that is the best nurse around. If he tries to do everything, it will be at the expense of performing operations which is where he has the greatest relative comparative advantage. So, even though the nurse may not be as skilled as he is, it may be worth the surgeon's while to say, 
Listen, as a nurse, you rate a 6, not a 9, like I do. Nevertheless, even though you're a little slower, it will help me if you take responsibility for nursing and you for anesthesiology. That way, I can devote myself entirely to performing operations. Though I could surely be a better anesthesiologist than you and a better nurse than you, it would be at the expense of doing something at which I have an even greater relative advantage. Therefore, cooperation between the most gifted at everything and the least gifted is still worthwhile to everyone, as long as each person specializes in the area in which he or she has the greatest comparative advantage, in relative terms. According to Hayek, we can be few and savage, or many and civilized. As an illustration, consider the neutron atomic bomb and the movie Mad Max. The neutron atomic bomb is a curious atomic bomb. When it explodes, it leaves all tangible assets intact. It kills only organic matter. Imagine a few neutron bombs fall, and of the six billion people on the face of the earth, all but six million are wiped out. However, all buildings, real estate, capital goods, libraries, books, recipes, formulas and computer programs remain intact. I ask you, would those six million survivors live in luxury? That's the philosophy of Malthus. There is enormous wealth, and since only six million people have to share it, they'd all be cruising around on enormous yachts, etc.? Or would they be poor? What do you think? They'd be destitute. Because a tiny fraction of the population would not be able to sustain the huge volume of practical knowledge that makes civilization possible. A woman about to give birth would be in the same situation as a primitive woman 5,000 years ago. She would have to go off by herself and give birth under a tree. Indeed, at least she would know how to bear a child au naturel, cut the umbilical cord and chew on a herb to avoid infection, etc. But it's a pitiful situation. These days they give the woman an epidural and everything is closely monitored. Beep, beep, beep. There's an army of creative entrepreneurs behind that. If there are not enough human beings to sustain the enormous volume of information that makes civilization possible, the world retracts. We would go back to the cave period, which is precisely what Mad Max depicts. In Mad Max, there has been a sort of cataclysm, and the scarcest resource is energy, gasoline. The characters are fighting in cars out in the desert, and they are killing each other for a barrel of gasoline. The vehicles are rather bizarre, and there are good guys and bad guys. Mel Gibson is one of the good guys. There is a huge volume of capital, but people are destitute, because they live in tiny tribes which compete for whatever meager resources they can come by. Since the collapse of the population has caused the entire chain of human interactions to disappear, we can be few and savage, or many and civilized. The necessary condition for the advancement of mankind and increasing wealth and what makes these things possible is growth in the population. As I explained the other day in Salamanca, it is also essential to dynamic efficiency, but we will discuss that later. Therefore, all institutions which contribute to population growth drive the advancement of civilization. Besides, the point I'm making is obvious. Let's see. What is the history of mankind with respect to economic development? What did the Industrial Revolution make possible? An increase in the population. Why are there 7 billion of us now when there were only a fraction of that number before the Industrial Revolution? If population growth were a detriment to economic development, there would be a lot fewer of us now. But instead, we are more numerous. And what is the process of migration to the cities? Cities like magnets are attracting more and more migrants. Cities are increasingly populated and increasingly wealthy. More people and more wealth more people and more wealth. It's obvious, because the capacity for the horizontal and vertical division of knowledge increases exponentially. As society becomes more developed, we become more ignorant. Relatively speaking, each person knows less of the entire body of information that benefits us. I am benefiting from a vast volume of information, and I know nothing. I know a few things about economics, but that's about it, compared to what I'd know if I lived in the jungle. Let's see. Another movie. 
What happens to Crocodile Dundee when they take him from the Australian outback and put him into the middle of Manhattan? That's what the movie is about. Well, the guy's amazed. He knows how to hunt a python, cut open the python, eat the python. He roasts a python in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Everybody thinks the guy is nuts, etc. And vice versa. What would happen if they took a New Yorker from Wall Street and put him into the Australian outback? He would last a fraction of a second. A poisonous snake would bite him. He would drink contaminated water. Do you see what I'm saying? To wrap up today's class, I'd like to talk for five minutes or so about the concept of society. We'll conclude the lesson with that because it is a fascinating concept. This course focuses primarily on entrepreneurial creativity, and in the preceding section, I criticize all the designing of mathematical models done by those who believe that resources are given and that all we need to do is maximize their allocation among a given number of human beings and thus avoid waste. This makes no sense, because resources are not given, but instead are constantly being created and more and more human beings are what is needed, as I have explained today. At this point, after all we have covered together, we are ready to grasp the concept of society. We're going to consider it together. It's the last section. Let's look at the whole subject in a nutshell. Society is a process. It is a process that carries with it the idea of dynamism, a dynamic structure. Do you know what a Meccano set is? When you were small, did any of you play with a Meccano set or an Erector set? They consist of connected parts that form a structure, like the structure of a building. Well, the social process is a more abstract concept, and it's difficult for us to visualize because it's like a Meccano structure that moves. That's almost impossible to imagine, but that's what the process is like, a spontaneous, dynamic structure. That is, one that nobody has consciously designed. I've described it that way in several lessons now. No one has created nor can create the social process. It emerges by itself. It is a highly complex process. It's like an extremely complex Meccano set. According to Hayek, this process is the most complex order conceivable in the universe. Think about that. Because it is comprised of billions of human beings. Imagine each of the nodules in a Meccano structure represents the head of a human being and there are billions of them. What's more, each head is constantly creating things and discovering new ends and means. Each of us is endowed with his or her own objectives, tastes, valuations and practical knowledge. And furthermore, each of us continually creates these things ex novo. So, I repeat, all of society is a highly complex spontaneous process. But what does it consist of? Human interactions. The nodule that is each head is connected with all the other heads through a human action, an interaction between humans. And what does this interaction involve? Basically, it is an exchange relationship. Remember the example of the Phoenicians, do ut des. I give you something, and you give me something. Exchange relationships connect all of the basic elements in the dynamic structure that makes up this very complex process. And these relationships are often reflected in monetary prices. Later, we will see how this makes economic calculation possible. Also, exchange relationships conform to certain rules, habits or standards of conduct. This is where institutions come in, and they are inseparable from society. What moves, what drives, what energy fuels this whole process, this exceedingly complex, spontaneous process of human interaction? The force of entrepreneurship. The leading role in the economy belongs to this force, and we have been discussing it since the beginning of the course. What does entrepreneurship do? It constantly creates, discovers and transmits information or knowledge. So the fuel that powers the spontaneous process is entrepreneurship, which creates or discovers information. Entrepreneurship also brings about the effect of coordination or adjustment. In other words, it adjusts or coordinates the contradictory plans of human beings. But how? Through competition. We've just looked at that today. Any contradictory plan is discovered, adjusted, and coordinated. Actors compete to make contradictory plans compatible with others. The first person to discover a maladjustment takes advantage of it. Well, what's the point of all this? What's the purpose of this whole spontaneous fuss nobody has created? It emerges on its own. No human being has created it. No human being has the capacity. 
What's it all for? Well, as scientists, we marvel at it. How amazing! But we don't know what it's for. Let's consider the effect this process has. The underlying purpose of the process may be the effect it produces. And when we analyze the effect, we realize that there is only one. This process multiplies life without limit. Life. The sustenance of more and more human beings, more human lives, lives of ever greater richness. As scientists, the only conclusion we can draw from this wondrous, spontaneous process is that it spreads, multiplies and fuels life. Both in quantitative terms, the number of lives, and qualitative terms, the quality of those lives. This and nothing else is society. And with this reflection, we'll say goodbye for today. I'll see you all back here next Tuesday. Thank you all.